And so we will begin our discussion of inviscid flow topics. If I bring up my notes, here we are. Okay, so what we found was when we were discussing the Rayleigh Taylor instability, we were going to assume inviscid flow, and we'll look at a couple more samples today. So for inviscid flow, we start with the Navier Stokes equations. So we start with our Navier Stokes equations, our momentum balance. But then if we can ignore the viscous terms, if these guys go away, we just delete that term and we get the inviscid equations, which are called the Euler equations. <laughs> and so for the Euler equations, we just went ahead and deleted the, Navier, the viscous terms. We then write down our mass balance. If it's incompressible, our mass balance would give us del dot u equals zero. And if it's, then we define this vorticity. And so we find that for many cases, we can assume it's both irrotational and um, incompressible. We're going to look at sound waves as an example where that's not true. But first, I want to talk about this idea of the vorticity. So I'll remind you that when you take the curl of the velocity field, if you have a chunk of fluid mass, a fluid particle, if you calculate the vorticity, that measures the rate of change that measures the rotation of this object. And so if a flow is irrotational, it means the object moves across but is not rotating. <clears throat> it could move in a circle, but note that even though this object is moving in a circle, it's not rotating. This object is not moving, but it's rotating. Okay? And again, that seemingly trivial dif difference, you might say, boy, that's crazy. These fluid mechanics people, who cares whether a chunk of fluid is rotating or not? And as I've said before, we care because it's going to drastically simplify the equations. And so what we learned was if you can assume incompressible and irrotational, if you could assume incompressible and irrotational, we found that that meant that you could write the velocity, the velocity vector could be written as the gradient of a scalar function called the potential, and therefore you got an equation del squared phi equals zero. So it turns out that if you can assume it's both incompressible and irrotational, that would be a dramatic simplification. All right. So the question is, why, and I gave this little example here. I suppose I had a bowling ball and I put grease on it and I couldn't get a good grip on it then I couldn't rotate it. And so what we would like is, what is the more mathematical statement of that idea that in the absence of viscous effects? So what we do is we start with our Navier-Stokes equations here. Expand a little bit. And so we start with our Navier-Stokes equations, and then we're going to take the curl of both sides. So when we take the curl, it means we're going to say epsilon i j k d by d x j of the velocity k. So take the curl of both sides. And on the left hand side, on the right hand side here, <clears throat> we have to, by the way, this is the place I did post on the in the extra notes folder on Compass. I posted that handout on index notation. This is a good time for you to be aware of that stuff because what we find is in order to do some of these operations, taking this curl of both sides. You need all these vector identities, or more importantly, if you just write everything in index notation, you can get it to work out. Okay? So if I take the curl, so if I take this curl, the curl of this term, you could see that since u is equal to the curl, that just goes down from there. This term goes right here. If I take the curl of the minus whatever rho gradient of p, you get a term that goes like gradient of rho cross gradient of p. And if I take the curl of this term, <coughs> u dot del omega, that turns out that because it's the derivative of a product, <coughs> that goes to two terms. You get the, this term here, but also this new term over here. <coughs> Excuse me. Apologize. <coughs> so all told then, we just take the curl of the Navier-Stokes equations, and that gives us this equation with all these terms, <clears throat> and these then, this then equation here is called the vorticity transport equation. 
And if we interpret what this vorticity transport equation is telling us, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, you see this is just our familiar <clears throat> d by dt plus u dot del is just our material derivative. <clears throat> so it says if I have a chunk of fluid, <clears throat> if I have a small chunk of fluid, and I follow that chunk of fluid as it moves through the flow, the rate of change of angular velocity, the vorticity, remember, is the angular velocity of the chunk of fluid. The rate of change of angular velocity as you follow this particle through the fluid <clears throat> is equal to three different terms. And then we said if the vorticity is initially equal zero, so if I have a bunch of fluid just sitting there at rest, <clears throat> if the vorticity is initially zero, this term would go away. <clears throat> if the fluid is of constant density, <clears throat> the pressure gradient, sorry, the density gradient would go to zero. <clears throat> and <clears throat> therefore, the only way I could I could get bound, I could get vorticity in the fluid, fluid is by viscous diffusion. <clears throat> and so this is why, for example, in the Rayleigh-Taylor situation, we said we have big mass of fluid of constant density. Constant density, <clears throat> the omega dt is equal to zero, and that's something called the Kelvin theorem. It says, in the absence of viscous effects, <clears throat> see what it says down here, in the absence of viscous effects, a fluid which is initially irrotational remains irrotational. <clears throat> so the only way that you can get vorticity into the fluid is if you've got some to start with, okay? In the case of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, where we have a density difference, we'll find that you can create vorticity at the interface between the two fluids, but that must then diffuse into <clears throat> the fluids by viscous action. All right? So what about these terms, though? <clears throat> Are there cases where we have to worry about this thing called vortex stretching or density gradients <clears throat> or viscous diffusion? Vortex stretching is an interesting one. <clears throat> Basically, we talked about this a little bit last night at office hour. Anytime you have tornadoes or hurricanes or turbulent flow in a pipe, <clears throat> I didn't mention this last night, vortex stretching is completely the foundation of turbulent flow. Why do we get turbulent flow in pipe? How does, how does the turbulence, <clears throat> how is that self-sustaining? And so let's talk about vortex stretching. So if I have a mass of fluid, which is slowly spinning around <clears throat> because of conservation of angular momentum. If I take that mass of fluid, which is slowly spinning around, and I stretch it in the vertical, by mass balance, the fluid must come in. <clears throat> and so basically, if you have mass balance, if you want to stretch it this way. So if i got a chunk of fluid, suppose I have a rotating mass of fluid. <clears throat> so I've got a big chunk of fluid like this. What if I take that mass, and this is rotating with some speed omega, all right? If I take that chunk of fluid and stretch it in the vertical while maintaining the same volume, it stretches out to look more like that, okay? And so what we find is, in those cases, just by conservation of angular momentum, you've got that chunk of fluid. If I stretch it out to a longer, thinner cylinder, it begins to spin much faster. The example I give is when you have ice skaters on the ice, the ice skaters go into a spin, they stick their arms way out to the sides, and then they start spinning around. As they start spinning around, they bring their arms in like this, and so they've gone from a fairly wide body to a very narrow body. Just conservation of angular momentum says the velocity must increase because you've taken the moment of inertia and decreased it by going to a much narrower cylinder. All right? So that's this idea of vortex stretching. If you have any mass of fluid, which is just sitting there slowly rotating, and you stretch it out, it's going to spin faster. This is why in a hurricane, you hear, you hear the newscasters say in a hurricane, you got the hurricane, it moved off from the cold Atlantic waters into the warm Gulf of Mexico. In the warm Gulf of Mexico, you start heating up that air, that hot air rises, it pulls the fluid into a tighter column, and therefore it begins to spin much more quickly. So the intensification of a hurricane is associated with this vortex stretching. Tornado, much the same process. 
we know that tornadoes often arise when you have strong thunderstorms. When you have strong thunderstorms, you get that rain that's as water vapor condenses to go to rain, releases a lot of heat. That heat causes an upward surge of the air. And so basically, we find when you have a severe thunderstorm, you have a mass of just slowly rotating fluid. But if you get a burst, which starts stretching in the vertical direction, it again, it spins it up. So conservation of angular momentum, it starts spinning very rapidly. And that's what happens when you have a, a tornado. So in tornadoes, we can get to wind speeds up to about, oh, perhaps 200 miles an hour in the most intense tornado. And how do you get to 200 miles an hour? Because you take all this very slow moving fluid, but you've got this really wide distribution. Maybe you've got a distribution of slow moving fluid that's just slowly rotating, but it's maybe it's a mile or so across. As you whole start pulling vertically up, as that fluid comes in, it's bringing its angular momentum with it. And so you get this very intensive uh, idea of vortex stretching. Uh, the third example of vortex stretching, which is very important for anybody who does <coughs> engineering, is turbulent flow in a pipe. Because what you, what you say is the following. Let's think about this. If I take my morning coffee and I pour some milk in my coffee and I stick a stir in, a spoon in and I just stir it, I get some swirling eddies, right? But after a period of time, those swirling eddies just decay out and they disappear. So if I look down at my coffee, uh, you know, a minute later, I said, oh, yeah, it's not swirling around anymore. Because owing to viscous diffusion, all that vorticity has decayed away. In a turbulent flow, just going straight down a pipe, if you're going straight down in a pipe, you have this swirling turbulent flow. How is it possible that those vortices, that those swirling motions in a turbulent flow are self-sustaining? Because there's viscous effects in a pipe, right? Why don't the vortices in a turbulent flow, why don't they just decay away so that you go back to a nice simple laminar flow? And the answer is vortex stretching. Because whenever you have a flow in a pipe, whether it's parabolic flow or whatever, if you have a flow in a pipe, um, here's a pipe, uh, let's see, here's a pipe. And suppose you have parabolic flow. We can find that the fluid in the center of the pipe is moving. There's a shear, there's a shear zone here. And so if I've got a little chunk of um, rotating fluid down here. If I've got a little turbulent eddy down here near the, in a shear zone, that little chunk of fluid, you have a shear zone. So the top is moving faster. And so that little chunk in this shear zone is going to get stretched out into a thin sort of slice like that. Is everybody happy with that? The flow is moving faster in the center of the pipe because it's moving faster in the center and slower at the sides. So you take two points. It's going to move faster in the center, slower at the side. It's going to stretch out. And so if you take a little chunk of vorticity, a little chunk of fluid down here, that little chunk of fluid is going to get stretched out. And so that's what keeps turbulence going. It's this vortex stretching. You form these eddies in the flow, but any eddies that are in the region of high shear are going to get stretched out, and they're going to start spinning very rapidly. And then they rotate around and move around through the flow. So it's the shear near the walls, which is very important in turbulent flow. And so that's why if you have a turbulent velocity profile, <clears throat> we know that in a turbulent velocity profile, you have an almost flat over most of the pipe, but a very sharp shear layer at the sides. And so in that very sh sharp shear layer, that's where all of the turbulent energy is being created. If you've got the vortices, <clears throat> They're basically leveraging off the mean flow. So the vortices are being stretched out. That's adding energy to the turbulence. And all of that energy is being created right near the wall. In the middle of the flow, <clears throat> all the turbulence die, all the eddy strengths die out. And so that's why the intensity in the middle of the flow is not very important. So all this is by way of saying, we haven't talked much about vortex stretching before, but you should be aware that in any number of different flows, Vortex stretching is incredibly important. So hurricanes, tornadoes, turbulent flows, vortex stretching is a big deal. All right. What we're of interest today, though, is the other two terms. 
<clears throat> because when we talk about a Rayleigh Taylor instability, a layer of water, say, sitting on top of air, and the fact it would come start falling down, the only place you have vorticity is right at the interface between the two fluids, <clears throat> and that can only get into the fluids by viscous diffusion. By viscous diffusion, it means there's going to be some length scale for viscous diffusion, like delta is going to go like square root of nu t. <clears throat> And so viscous effects in Rayleigh Taylor will be quite small. <clears throat> but <clears throat> there's this other term in vorticity transport, and this has to do with what's called um, what's called baroclinic vorticity generation. It's the gradient of density cross the gradient of pressure. <clears throat> if the gradient of density and the gradient of pressure are parallel, Cross product of two vectors that are parallel is zero. But what we find here is <clears throat> that in several important cases, <clears throat> they're not necessarily parallel. And so <clears throat> one example I'm going to give you So one example I'm going to give you is in atmospheric flows. And so, um, you know what? Let me try to do this. See if I can add a piece of paper in here. Um, <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> so suppose I have the following. <clears throat> Suppose I have a pressure gradient in the x direction. <clears throat> I do apologize for my voice this morning. So if I have a pressure gradient, I think it's the snow coming tomorrow. <clears throat> so if I look at a chunk of fluid <clears throat> and I do F equals MA. Okay? So if I have a chunk of fluid there, the pressure gradient is pushing it sideways and that chunk of fluid has constant density. F equals MA, <clears throat> and so all the chunks of fluid are going to start moving at the same speed. <clears throat> but now, suppose I have the pressure gradient is horizontal, but the density gradient is vertical. So suppose now I have a chunk of fluid <clears throat> where I have a little column of fluid here, and there's a density gradient. <clears throat> such that we'll make the uh, column of fluid look like this. So the density <clears throat> is lighter on top and heavier on the bottom. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so now let's see what happens. Suppose I have, I get up <clears throat> and I have <clears throat> Two things sitting in front of me. One, I have, uh, uh, suppose I have a basketball and I apply a certain force to a basketball. It starts to move nicely. <clears throat> suppose I have a bowling ball and I apply the same force <clears throat> to a bowling ball and a basket. So basketball and a bowling ball. Which is going to move faster? The basketball is going to move faster. F equals MA. So if you have lower mass, more acceleration. So now, when I apply this pressure, I'm going to get the top has a low density. It's going to move fast. The bottom's going to move fairly slowly. <clears throat> Is everybody happy with that? Oops. So we should delete that, that one. Okay. So because I have this density gradient. What I find is <clears throat> that the cross product of a pressure gradient times a density gradient gives me some rotation. So you can see what I've done here <clears throat> is I've created some rotation, whereas here I have not. And so this idea of a pressure gradient crossed with a density gradient <clears throat> gives you rotation. 
So why is this important? Well, if you look at the atmosphere, when you have a storm front come through, you look at the weather map, it shows you these pressure fronts. And so if you have a pressure front coming through in the atmosphere, you have a horizontal gradient of pressure. <clears throat> but because of changes in the temperature and also hydrostatic, the layers of the atmosphere have different density. Usually as you go up in the atmosphere, you get to lighter fluid. So what happens is when a pressure front starts to come through, <clears throat> it accelerates those upper lighter layers more quickly. And so it induces this big shear velocity. <clears throat> and so this idea, what's called baroclinic vorticity generation, is extremely important in the atmosphere. It's why we get these huge turbulent flows. It's why, for example, <clears throat> the pilot of an airplane. I don't know about you. I can't even remember the last time I've been on an airplane. I think it was like 16 months ago. <clears throat> but if you're flying on an airplane, the pilot says, oh, we've got some clear air turbulence coming up. <clears throat> and just suddenly the airplane just starts shaking all over. That's because if you just had a normal, a nice pressure gradient, <clears throat> but there were just changes in the density of the atmosphere, that created this layer of intense rotation or intense vorticity. <clears throat> that then led to turbulence. Okay, so that's the case of the atmosphere. What about what we're talking about in our case? <clears throat> well, in the case of a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, where we assume density rho 1 on top of density rho 2, for Rayleigh-Taylor instability, <clears throat> Rayleigh-Taylor, That was just fluid row one over row two. <clears throat> we had constant density, and so we were in the top case, the no density gradient. On the other hand, when we looked at the Bernard problem, for the Bernard problem, we said, oh, let's look at a case where we're heated from below. <clears throat> and so for a Bernard problem, we have this density where we have rho bigger to Bernard problem, we already had a density difference built in. <clears throat> so for Bernard problem, because we have a density gradient built in, then we have the possibility that if there's any flow, any pressure changes, you will definitely get <clears throat> some vorticity creation, okay? And so this is the idea of <clears throat> Rayleigh-Taylor, mostly <clears throat> irrotational everywhere we go. Bernard problem, <clears throat> because you do have a density difference, a density variation, you can get this <clears throat> vorticity generation. So that's why it's critical for us to consider <clears throat> viscous terms throughout the whole body of fluid in the Bernard problem, whereas in the Rayleigh-Taylor problem, we can get away with an inviscid approximation because we have the constant density. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, questions on this idea of this, uh, what's this baroclinic vorticity, this dense vorticity generation owing to density variation? So, are we all good with this? <clears throat> okay. So, um, so this vorticity transport equation, we normally do cover in the graduate fluid mechanics course. I tried to slough over it, but I recognized um, with the number of questions that were coming up in two different office hours, that it is really important just to take a few minutes like this to go over this. All right. So the next thing we need after we talk about the vorticity transport is, so, so again, we had the idea of the, oops, let me scrunch back down. So we had the idea of potential flow then. And the next thing I said is, oh, what about the Bernoulli equation? And I wanted to just mention briefly here, how do we get the derivation of the Bernoulli equation for unsteady flows? And so the Bernoulli equation works like the following. We're going to, we have to assume inviscid flow, and we're also going to assume constant density and irritational. 
So if we have inviscid flow, we start with our Navier-Stokes equations, <coughs> but we're going to ignore the viscous terms, <coughs> and we have the Euler equations. The next thing is there's this really convenient identity for this term u dot del u. We look at this term u dot del u, <coughs> and we find it by using a vector identity, by writing this in index notation and deriving the vector identity, we find that u dot del u can be written as the sum of two terms. It's the, and this is true for any flow. No, u dot del u, whether it's rotational, irrotational, compressible, incompressible, any possible velocity, any vector, any vector, doesn't even have to be a velocity vector. <clears throat> for any vector, u dot del u is identically equal to the gradient <clears throat> of one half u squared minus u cross the curl of u. You can work that out in index notation. Um, I don't know, it might actually be in the handout. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that expression and we're going to take this expression and substitute it in here into the velocity, okay? So where I had u dot del u, you see here it is, I put that expression in, okay? And so these are my Euler equations in so-called, this is sometimes called the rotational form. So if I talk about the rotational form of the Navier-Stokes equations or the rotational form of the Euler equations, what it means is I've taken this vector identity and I've taken that u dot del u term and replaced it with these terms. No approximation. This is exact mathematics. The reason we call it the rotational form is because it includes the curl u, which is the rotation of the fluid. Okay? All right. So that's our starting point. Inviscid means I got to throw out the, the viscous terms. If I now say assume the flow is irrotational, why should I assume it's irrotational? Because of what we just discussed with the vorticity transport. So if it's irrotational, curl u is zero, and so I get to throw away this term. So let's, here's our two terms from the identity. But if it's irrotational, the curl velocity is equal to zero, so I get to throw away that term. Okay. Next, I'm going to assume it's constant density. So if I can assume it's constant density, when I have this term here, 1 over rho grad p, if it's constant density, I can take the rho inside the grading operator, and so that term becomes this guy right here. Okay? Next thing I'm going to say is, all right, let's see what i got so far. Here's my Euler equation. I've got the gradient of the magnitude. So there's the gradient of the magnitude of velocity. I've got a gradient of pressure over rho. But I've got a du dt. Now remember, the velocity can be written as the gradient of phi, right? That's the whole point. If it's irrotational, u can be written as gradient of phi. So I just take that gradient of phi and stick it in for the velocity. And so I've got almost all of my terms now are written as the gradient. The only thing left over is this little vector g, the gravitational vector. And I'll just note that g can be written as the gradient of g dot x. And so for an irrotational constant density fluid, I can write all those terms, and then I can collect them all under one bracket, and I get that the gradient of that combination is equal to zero everywhere. If I can say inviscid, so ignore viscosity, inviscid, irrotational, constant density for those three assumptions, I can then put all of those terms together and I get the gradient of that expression in parentheses is equal to zero, and therefore that expression is equal to a constant. And so that's our generalized Bernoulli equation for a irrotational inviscid constant density fluid. Now, the interesting thing here is, <laughs> in undergraduate courses, you often see the Bernoulli equation derived as a form of the energy balance. You say, oh, you take an energy balance and you ignore viscous losses and you get a Bernoulli equation. But in fact, there's actually a much more direct way. Does anybody, we didn't mention the energy equation here at all. 
This just comes from the momentum balance. So the momentum balance in an inviscid flow guarantees us the Spinoli equation. So, um, I wanted to do this little derivation here just to show you that where does this d phi dt come from? Because you cannot derive this form of the Bernoulli equation. This form of the Bernoulli equation cannot be defined if you have from an energy balance. You must look at the momentum balance and get it from the Euler equations in order to get the proper term for d phi dt. Okay? So this is the form of our Bernoulli equation. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> when we went down to our <clears throat> Rayleigh-Taylor, why is this so important? I'll remind you, for when we did our Rayleigh-Taylor instability, <clears throat> we talked about the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. We found that our dynamic boundary condition <clears throat> was this idea that the pressure, P1 must equal P2, on the interface. But in order to go any further, I had to substitute in my Bernoulli equations. OK? And so in each fluid, <clears throat> I've got constant density rho 1 up at the top. I've got constant density row two down here at the bottom. In each fluid, I can write a separate Bernoulli equation for each fluid. <clears throat> okay, and so that was critical for our ability to analyze the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. <clears throat> How are we doing on time? Pretty good. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me then say, all right, just to go over, we did our Rayleigh-Taylor analysis and. We substituted in our normal modes. We calculated all this. We, we did this. Um, problem number one on problem set number five. I'll remind you, problem set number five I emailed out last night will be due a week from Thursday. And we'll talk about it next Monday in the office hour, if you like. And we did this for a... The first thing we did was we did this case of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. Supposing we had an infinite layer of fluid, so it goes up to positive, in the y direction, goes up to plus infinity, in the x y direction, minus infinity. But also we said, let's suppose it's infinitely broad. So we said, what are our eigenfunctions? In this case, we have no eigenfunctions. Instead, we have Fourier transforms. And so when we introduced our normal modes, For our normal modes, we just put e to the i k x because we're saying it was infinitely wide in the x direction. Okay. And also, <clears throat> we used our boundary condition. We solved for <clears throat> our solution for x and y, and we found that it would be, oh, it's going to be e to the k y or e to the minus k y. <clears throat> we applied our boundary conditions so that velocity went to zero up at plus infinity and minus infinity, and that gave us our solution for phi 1 and phi 2. On well, the homework, <clears throat> I'm asking you to look at a infinitely wide case, but on the homework, I'm saying, suppose we have the following. <clears throat> on the homework problem, I say, hey, suppose we just have a rigid plate and you have a layer of water And so we'll let this be y equals 0, and we'll let this be y equals h. And we go down here to, and we have a layer of air. So we have, uh, I'm sorry, what did I do here? Which one is row 1? Blue is water, row 1. <clears throat> and so I have row 2 down here is my air. And I have row one here is my water. <clears throat> it just have to be water. And then I go down to y is minus infinity here. Okay. <clears throat> and so on the homework problem, previously for our, our solution for our normal modes, we got this idea of e to the plus or minus ky because my boundary condition was going up to positive infinity. Well, now we're still going to get down here in the green for phi 2. Phi 2, we're still going to get the same thing. We'll get a C2 e to the ky 
e to the sigma t e to the i k x. <clears throat> but for phi one, we have, by the way, all the boundary conditions at the interface are the same boundary condition the interface. But <clears throat> for phi one, <clears throat> you're going to be looking at phi one is probably going to equal e to the i k x. And <clears throat> we've done enough separation of variables. You know that you could write it as e to the k y plus e to the minus y. <clears throat> But it's probably the case that you're probably going to want a cinch kx ky or a cosh ky. And I'll leave it to you to work out the details. <clears throat> okay. So the difference is we worked out the basic theory <clears throat> for Rayleigh Taylor instability for an infinite height of fluid over an infinite height of fluid. Now, if I said I had a vertical, if I have a horizontal plate, <clears throat> where's my If I have a rigid horizontal layer, and I say, suppose I've got a thin layer of water sitting on the bottom here, and I want to know what, so, you know, suppose I have like a millimeter thick layer of water. I want to know how, what is going to be the frequent, how far apart do I expect droplets to form? So that layers of water might form droplets, and I'd like to know, okay, what would be the wavelength that's most unstable so it would tell me how fast, how far apart do I expect the droplets to form? That's a classic problem of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, but for a finite layer of liquid dripping from a rigid surface. <clears throat> and so this is the way that I'll just let you work out the details. The short answer is <clears throat> it's pretty easy, except you have to differentiate a center cosh instead of just an exponential. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So that's the case of what happens if we have a finite height in a vertical direction. The other case, which I want to talk about briefly, and we're about <clears throat> five minutes from a break, <clears throat> we also talked about the idea of surface tension and how that modified the growth rate. And we solved for sigma squared like that. <clears throat> and, um, oh, so before I get to the case of side boundaries, I want to address a question that did, a very important question came up in office hour. So I said, if sigma squared, is greater than zero. So if sigma squared, sigma squared is greater than zero, sigma is real, and it'll have a plus term and a minus term, and so I say that's unstable. And so if sigma squared is greater than zero, we call that our stability criterion. Did I have a, I don't have it here. Um, so you take square root of a positive number, you get a real number. And so it's one mode grows exponentially, the other decays. If sigma squared is less than zero, I claimed it was stable. But that means that sigma, say, is equal to, say, plus or minus, I'll call it i omega. And so you might say, well, wait a minute, John, that doesn't decay. What does it mean if sigma squared is less than zero? How could sigma squared be less than zero? Well, if I have either, if I have very short waves, then the K term will dominate, or if I put the heavy fluid on the bottom, so either one of those cases, I will get sigma squared negative. But if sigma squared is negative, sigma is going to be an imaginary number, but it's not going to decay. But what does that mean? That means, simply, when I go back and look at my normal modes up here, <clears throat> so when I look at my normal modes, I'll have eta. is equal to eta naught times e to the i k x e to the i omega t. How about if I make it e to the minus i omega t, if you like. It doesn't matter, I'll put i omega t. But that's eta naught e to the i times k x plus omega t. 
So that would be things like eta naught times sine <clears throat> kx minus omega t or cosine. And that <clears throat> is just the equation for waves. And so basically, <clears throat> this Rayleigh-Taylor instability gave us something else for free. It says if you're looking at an initial disturbance, say on water, suppose I have suppose I have water on the bottom, air on the top. So I'm now looking at a case where it's stable, right? Water's on the bottom, it's not gonna suddenly come. But if I now perturb this surface, so I put this perturbation on, here's my Rayleigh Taylor. I perturb the surface, and I find if the water's on the bottom, that perturbation's not gonna grow but instead, it's just gonna propagate off as a wave, okay? And indeed, that is what happens. You have water waves. So if I take a tank of water, air above, and put the water on the bottom, and I perturb it, I throw a rock in, or I put in, suppose I take a piece of car corrugated cardboard, corrugated metal, and I press that down on the surface of the water to get that shape, and I suddenly pull it out. I've got that wave motion, I've got that wave shape, and all of a sudden, I see it just prop starts propagating off. In fact, it can propagate in either direction, go to plus or minus. And so this is what we find is the reason we say sigma squared greater than zero to get a real number, which means these disturbances will grow. So if you have a real number here, you'll just get infinite growth, exponential growth. If you have a negative number, if sigma squared is negative, we say it's stable because that initial disturbance will actually propagate, break up into two different waves, one moving left and one moving right, okay? So that's what the deal is with respect to the growth rate. Okay, um, then the last thing I wanna just mention is briefly what we have is, what if we have side boundaries? So if we have side boundaries, so now instead of, so now what I have is the following. I'm back to my interface. And I'm going to put my water back up. Uh, so I have row one and row two. So let's put our water on the top, row two, and our air on the bottom, <coughs> row one. <coughs> but now I'm not, again, I, in I look at the linear PDEs, I say, oh, let's solve by separation of variables. Now, I don't have infinite in the X direction. I have a finite distance, goes from zero to L. So instead of having Fourier transforms, just E to the IKX, I substitute, I do my separation of variables, and I'll find eigenfunctions. And so the question is, what would be the eigenfunction in the X direction if you've got no penetration, velocity can't get through that wall, on the left and right. And so the two boundary conditions, instead of it just being periodic, now if you have sidewalls, your boundary condition is just that the gradient is equal to zero at left and right. And sure enough, when we do that, we find that our eigenfunction is cosine kx, where k equals n pi over l for um, n is an integer, okay? so. Bottom line is this Rayleigh-Taylor instability, you can analyze it for boundaries of any arbitrary shapes for side boundaries. For side boundaries, it affects your eigenfunction. And we just get, instead of just e to the ikx, we get cosine kx because that's with a specific value. So again, the main difference is if it's infinite domain, it's e to the plus or minus ikx, but k can be any value at all. Hence Fourier transform. If you have side boundaries, you have to get eigenfunctions. It's now cosine kx, but instead of k being any possible value, now you just have k must be equal to these values n pi over l. And so there's only a certain number of modes that you can introduce, okay? And so that's the idea. So if you wanna know if you have two rigid side boundaries, what's the minimum wavelength? Well, it would just be the smallest eigenfunction for cosine would be um, 
cosine of pi L would just be this. And it would look like that. And so that's your nearest, so that has zero slope at the ends. And that would be your first eigenmode. <clears throat> okay. So you can go ahead and calculate that. And this would tell us, then we can now look at this and say, okay, what is the mode which is most unstable? It's the single thing. And so what you can say is, ah, if I take two pieces of glass plate, if I put two glass plates maybe only a millimeter apart, if I put them only a millimeter apart and it's an air-water system, that layer of water sits there and you, it doesn't fall. But if I instead I put plates that say are a centimeter or so apart, then I find that the layer of water would fall. All right? But absolutely, two plates which are held very close together that droplet of that layer of water will just sit in there because of the fact of surface tension. But as you move that further apart, you get to lower values of K, longer waves, and sure enough, you get to the point where sigma squared gets positive and falls. Right? You can also do this example for instead of having two rigid sidewalls, you could have this problem of how about if you had a cylinder, like a capillary tube. And so if you have a cylinder, in this case, your eigenfunctions are not unfortunately just cosine of x, but for a cylinder, you would get a Bessel function, j naught, and that would be your eigenfunction. But you can go ahead and plug that in and you can say, oh, if I have a capillary tube, again, if you take a test tube, like, you know, about a one centimeter diameter test tube, you find the water would just drain out. But if you went down to a smaller capillary tube of the order of a couple millimeters or so, you'd find that that water just sits in there and you can't get it out. Okay. So um, that summarizes what we basically needed to talk about, about the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. I did want to point out that we do have these problems with respect to enclosures. For the record, you absolutely, it's more work, but you can combine the homework problem with this problem and you could have boundary conditions. You could have like a, a domain that looks like this, Suppose you had a channel where you had both a top surface rigid and side walls. Again, we've learned enough about separation of variables, it would just combine it. I would get my cosine kx for my eigenfunction, but for my y dependence, I'd get my center cosh. Okay. And so these are all the ways that you can generalize the analysis of the Rayleigh Taylor instability to other different geometries. Okay. Uh, time for a break. That's all I want to talk about about Rayleigh Taylor today. Um, and um, so, what we're going to do then is we're going to take a break. And then, after the break, I want to come back and talk a little bit about sound waves because we've learned enough now about the inviscid flow, about irrotational flow. We've learned enough about the Euler equations that we can, and we've learned enough about perturbation methods that we can take these simple equations and we, it's actually quite simple to derive the equations to say, all right, suppose I clap my hands. When I clap my hands, I don't know about you guys, but I heard a sound here. I didn't, but I didn't clap it too close to the microphone. When I clap my hands, I'm compressing that fluid. And that propagates, that creates a disturbance in the fluid, which propagates as a pressure wave up to my ear where I can hear it. Okay. We're going to see how the equations of fluid mechanics give us that prediction. And this will be our one example where we look at the idea of compressible flow plus thermodynamics plus heat transfer. And we'll go through the derivation. Good news is it's just linearized PDEs, same as before. We get to ignore nonlinear terms. We'll walk through this after uh, a break. So I've got it some um, 1025. Let's take a five minute break. We'll start back up at 1030 and we can easily, this is basically this one slide, we can easily finish up in the next 20 minutes. So, okay. So with that, um, thank you. I'll see you in five. <clears throat> okay, we're back. Um, 
By the way, just before I get to the sound waves business, I want to go back to the one thing I forgot to mention about the Navier Stokes equations and why am I focusing, why am I obsessing so much about the vorticity? People say, well, shouldn't you be worried about where are the viscous effects important? And the reason we focus on the vorticity is very simple. <clears throat> if we have an irrotational flow, we can write a velocity as the velocity potential. But del squared phi equals zero. And so therefore, if you take del squared of u is equal to del squared of the gradient of phi is equal to the gradient of del squared phi, and that's identically equal to zero. And so if you go back to your Navier-Stokes equations, where you have a mu dot del u term, if the velocity is irrotational, then viscosity can be whatever, it's, whatever you like, and you would still get this idea of del squared u is equal to zero. Um, so you can have an example of Stokes flow. You can have zero Reynolds number. Viscosity is immense, but if you have an irrotational flow, the viscous forces are identically equal to zero. What's an example of that? Suppose I take a big tank of corn oil or glycerin, and if I insert a capillary tube and I start inflating a little balloon, that's what we call a point source velocity. And so as you inflate that little balloon, it's pushing the fluid out radially in all directions. The velocity in that case is just U equals some volume flow Q divided by four pi R squared times ER. And so that's an example of, or U is equal to the gradient of phi of one over R. And so what we have that, that's an example of an irrotational flow. Even though the Reynolds number is zero, the viscous forces are identically equal to zero, okay? So the reason we focus so much on this vorticity trans this vorticity or the vorticity transport is if the vorticity is equal to zero, the viscous effects are equal to zero. And so we got no viscous effects to worry about. The mu del squared u term goes to zero, okay? All right, so that's that. All right, so let's get back then to talking about the sound waves. I got 15 minutes or so to talk about sound waves. And so what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at small velocity. So when I clap my hands, a pressure wave goes out, but it's very slight velocity. When you see me clap my hands, you're not suddenly blown away. When you hear my voice, as far as I know, and all the teaching I've done, nobody has ever been blown away by anything I've said during any of my lectures, okay? So the sound wave comes, you can hear it because of the very sensitive hairs inside your ear, but the velocities are small. And so what we're gonna assume is that when you have a sound wave, we're gonna talk about the linear theory of sound. So we're not talking about explosions which are gonna blow the doors off the house or whatever. The linear theory of sound waves. We're going to assume the velocity is small, the pressure variations are small, and the density variations are small, okay? So with that, I can look at my Navier-Stokes equations here. So I have my momentum balance, I have my Navier-Stokes equations. In the linearized form, I'm gonna assume that rho can just be written as rho naught for the inertial terms. And du dt is carries over, but u dot del u, that term is a nonlinear term. We've seen before, linearized PDEs. So this is an example of yet another case where we're linearizing a PDE for small disturbances. As a sound wave is propagating through the room, it's a small disturbance. And so I just get right here, I get my um, linearized Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, by the way, I've neglected, again, I'm neglecting the viscous terms, why? Because if I have a sound, if I'm sitting in a room with no air moving, and suddenly I either clap my hands or I'm speaking, there is a density variation going through the fluid, but it's going fairly quickly and viscous effects. So the fluid is irrotational, right? I'm standing in a room, air's not moving, 
So U is zero, omega is zero. So it's initially irrotational. Therefore, it would take a while for viscous effects to become important. You can do the effects of viscous later. It's only a correction. And over a time scale that it takes for the sound wave to pass through the room, viscous effects are negligible. So I get to throw away viscous effects, much like I do for the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. And we have a linearized Navier-Stokes equation. This is just equation one. Next, we move to our mass balance. Here, we have to be a little careful. For the mass balance, it's the first time where we're considering a compressible flow. So we no longer have div u equals zero. For a compressible flow, as that sound wave propagates through, chunks of air are compressing and expanding. Compressing and expanding. And if any of you have ever played with a slinky, the classic demonstration is you take, you know what a slinky is. I hope everybody knows what a slinky is. A slinky is this long sort of spiral, helical sort of thing made of wire or plastic these days. And if you just pop the end of the slinky, you can see that compression wave. You can see that go through the whole body of the slinky. And it's ex an expansion compression. Okay? That's what a sound wave is doing. So here's my full mass balance, d rho dt plus u dot del rho plus rho div u equals zero. That's the full statement of my mass balance. Right, but I'm assuming both velocity and density variations are small. And so this u dot del rho term, oops, that's gonna go away. So that's gradient of rho is density fluctuation, that's gonna go away. What about rho div u? Well, rho, I can approximate as rho naught, and so I'll get that this equation becomes my linearized mass balance becomes rho naught div u is equal to minus d rho dt. Okay. Again, just like we've done before, for each variable we're introducing, we're saying let velocity equal say u bar plus u prime. Density equals rho, rho naught plus rho prime. Pressure equals p naught plus p prime. Okay. So we have our mass balance is equation number two. Our momentum balance equation number one. And now, whenever you introduce a compressible flow, you have to go and say, all right, what is the state equation? You have to say, what kind of fluid am I going to consider? Am I going to consider it as an ideal gas? Am I going to consider it as a, you know, a, a Van der Waals gas? What sort of what is my state equation? How is pressure related to volume and temperature? And so we're going to say for our state equation, we're going to assume a linear state equation. We'll say rho equals rho naught plus p minus p naught times d rho dp. So we're going to assume that density is a linear function of pressure change. Okay. So then it turns out those are the, all the equations we need. So first what we're going to do is we're going to take d by dt of the state equation. So we're going to take this state equation. And we're just going to take d by dt of both sides. And that gives me an equation for d rho dt. And so I see that, oh, that's interesting. Because of the linear functionality here, I'm assuming that partial rho with respect to p is evaluated some naught at these rest conditions. And so that's just a constant. So d rho dp naught, that is a constant, which I've evaluated. And so d rho dt equals a constant times dp dt. Right? I then take that result and I say, well, where did I have a d rho dt? Well, up here, I have a d rho dt in my mass balance. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this expression. We're just going to take our state equation, take d by dt, and substitute in here, right here, in the right-hand side of the mass balance. And I get this equation. Then So equation 4, this new equation 4, it's just a combination of my mass balance plus my state equation. And then finally, I want to try to um, eliminate the velocity completely. So now I want to say, all right, I've still got a div u here. I've got a velocity up here. I want to eliminate the velocity and just find an equation, say, for the pressure or density. Let's say, suppose I want an equation for the pressure. So if I say, all right, equation 1, Hmm. 
I've got a d by dt in equation one, but I don't have a divergent. Equation four, I've got a div u, but I don't have a d by dt. So what we're going to do is we're going to take d by dt of this equation, and we're going to take the divergence of this equation, and then this will have a d by dt of div u, and we'll also have a d by dt of div u. So by taking the divergence of equation one and time derivative of equation four, we can get d by dt of div u in both, and then we can eliminate it. So we take that, we subtract them, and sure enough, here's the final equation we get. d2 p dt squared equals that constant times del squared p. And anyone who's taken freshman physics recognizes that as a wave equation. And so what we've effectively done is we've derived the equation for the propagation of sound waves in a fluid. And we find that the speed of sound, c squared, so this guy, remember wave equation is of the form of, uh, a wave equation is d2 p dt squared equals one over c squared times del squared p. And so basically, this analysis has shown us that the pressure wave, that when I clap my hands, that goes to my ear, goes to the microphone, and then goes out to you guys electronically. That's a pressure, it's a fluctuating pressure field. And I find that I've been able to predict that C squared, I've found that I've been able to predict the wave speed, which is the speed of sound. And so what we get is, we get this result that the speed of sound is you take d rho dp at your initial conditions, and then you go ahead and you take the inverse of that, and that gives you c squared. Right? Now, in the history of science, there's sometimes when people say, man, I was that close, but I screwed up. So the question is, how do you calculate d rho dp at the rest conditions? The original theory for this speed of sound, the, for this that we've just presented today, was due to Stokes. Stokes theorem, Stokes equation, Stokes flow, that's, that's Stokes. George Gabriel Stokes, mathematician Cambridge. He developed this theory, I don't even remember, I'm sorry, it was like 1840, 1850-ish. But he said, okay, I've got a sound wave going through the room. It's isothermal. Let's assume it's an ideal gas and it's isothermal. Temperature's not changing, right? And he said, all right, let's evaluate C squared based on it, assuming it's isothermal. Unfortunately, if you do that, you come out with about a 20% error. Back then, they were able to measure the, measuring sound speed is actually quite easy. If you um, just stand, uh, you know, stand a mile away from somebody or stand, not, you don't have to, stand a mile away and somebody rings a bell. He holds up a bell and bang, he clangs the bell. You can hear it. And you can see it. So you look at him in binoculars and bang, you, in speed of light, you see when he struck the bell and then you wait. And it takes a second or so. Actually, it takes uh, um, a few seconds for the sound to get to your ear if he's a mile away. And so you can actually measure it with a stopwatch. Sound speed is very easy to measure. So Stokes, back around 1840-ish, 50-ish, gave us a theory predicted it was the isothermal for an ideal gas, and he was off by 20%. It was not until Rayleigh came along about 30 or 40 years later, Lord Rayleigh, he said, mm, no, what happens is, as that sound wave goes through the fluid, the sound wave is traveling so fast that heat does not, there's no time for heat transfer. So we can do all the scaling analysis we've done. You know, we've talked about, oh, you've got this square root of new T for viscous terms. Well, same thing for heat transfer. If I suddenly compress something, it takes a while for it to get back to isothermal. So if I suddenly compress something, it heats up and it takes a while for it to get back to isothermal. And so what Rayleigh said is, no, it's not isothermal. It's isentropic because it's happening too quick for the heat to transfer. <laughs> 
And very simple uh, experiment you can do. It's hard to do with air. But a nice little simple experiment you can do is if just reach in your desk drawer, if you have a little rubber band, rubber band similar to air in the sense that air, we have this compression, we have this density, we can store energy if I compress the air. Well, in a rubber band, if you take a rubber band, you know, nice big quarter inch thick rubber band, office rubber band, if I suddenly stretch that, I'm adding energy and it heats up. If I release it, it cools down. And so if you look at it in the spirit of how sound goes, you can pull it and then release it. You can actually feel that rubber band heating up and cooling down. And so, uh, by the way, the, one of the most sensitive parts of your skin is either your cheek or your lip. Mm. You, your wrist is good enough too, but you need three hands. So if you have a volunteer to stretch the rubber band. So basically, if you just take that rubber band, stretch it, press it up against your lip, and you can actually feel the temperature of that rubber band changing. You might say, well, John, no, I'm in a room at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's isothermal, right? Nope. If you stretch that rubber band, you'll find it warms up and cools down, warms up and cools down. Similar way when sound wave propagates through air, it warms up and cools down. You don't have enough time. It's happening so quick because the sound wave comes through and goes by. You don't have enough time for heat transfer to maintain isothermal. So if you do the math, tiny bit of thermo. So in both cases, we're going to assume ideal gas. So P equals rho RT divided by the molecular weight. And if it's isothermal, you can just calculate that C squared is equal to RT over the molecular weight. On the other hand, if it's isentropic, we can just do our sums. You do the first law, you write the first law, you substitute in the ideal gas, et cetera. And so if you do that, you find that for an isentropic ideal gas, you can say that PV to the gamma is equal to a constant. And gamma is the ratio of specific heat. So gamma is the ratio of CP of CV is 1.4. So when you go through all the analysis, you'll come out with, for an isothermal, you get the exact same result for sound speed C squared, except that you have a factor of gamma in there. So Stokes predicted this for isothermal. Really predicted that you should use isentropic and you introduce this factor of 1.4. When you take the square root, square root of 1.4 is like 1.19. So basically Stokes had about, when you compare it to experiments, if you compare it to experiments down here, experimentally, you can measure the speed of sound at 20 degrees C is about 340 meters per second. The theory of Rayleigh predicts that it would be 343 meters per second. So that's pretty darn good. That's less than 1% error or of the order of 1% error. And so the difference is about 20%. Um, Stokes assumed it was isothermal. He came out with 290 meters per second, and that would be about a 20% error. So, um, so I just wanted you to see this one example, this idea of sound propagation because it combines all of what we've been doing, linearized PDEs, thermodynamics, and one case where we have density variation. So, okay. Um, I have one question in the chat box, which I'll talk about vortex stretching, but we're at the end of today's time. So I will let you go and I will look forward to seeing you all on Friday. So thank you very much.